let's take a moment and have people get a little bit deeper on how the immune system works. I, I, I remember for me personally in medical school, it was one of the most interesting uh, sets of courses we took were the courses in immunology. In particular, how T cells worked was fascinating. It, it, it seemed to lend itself to a story almost and with generals and soldiers and all of these things. Um, so explain to people, let's maybe start with a virus as the example, because obviously in the, in the era of coronavirus, that's on everybody's mind. And we can talk about how uh, the body defeats a virus, but then pivot to then how in the, in the case of cancer, that exact same immune system can accomplish what you just said. So let's take viral infection as an example, whether it's a common cold or coronavirus. The virus comes into the body and infects the respiratory epithelium in the pharynx and the bronchi and the lung. And as that virus then infects those respiratory epithelium, the virus replicates and the infected cells then express the viral proteins. The immune system has evolved to detect proteins or other molecules that are not part of the normal self of the body. As the immune system evolves, cells that can recognize foreign invaders get spared, whereas cells that can attack normal tissue get eliminated in the thymus. And so except for autoimmune diseases, we don't have cells that can recognize normal tissues. They've been eliminated in the evolution of our immune systems. So you have lymphocytes, B cells that make antibodies, T cells that act directly by interacting with, uh, with other, uh, other tissues. And so the immune system via antibodies or T cells recognizes viral protein that's now being expressed by the respiratory cell. The lymphocytes are constantly patrolling the body. Every 14 or 15 seconds, your heart's pumping out these lymphocytes that are circulating <clears throat> through the uh, vascular system, sometimes extravasating into tissues, coming back into the lymphoid system and returning to the heart via the thoracic duct. <clears throat> well, when the lymphocyte encounters a foreign antigen to which it can have reactivity, that's not self. And define an antigen for folks. To tell people what an antigen is. How long is it? What's it made of? So an antigen is a molecule in the body that is not normally being expressed in the body by tissues. They're generally proteins, but they can be carbohydrates. And what makes that molecule an antigen is its ability to be recognized by a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. That is a T lymphocyte that can directly recognize an infected cell or a B lymphocyte that can make antibodies against it, plasma cells. And so if a molecule is recognized as foreign, the immune system can recognize that, uh, that antigen. Well, lymphocytes are patrolling the body. They encounter this viral antigen in the respiratory epithelium. They stop at that location, and you can visualize this in mouth ears with something called two-photon microscopy. They stop at that location, and you can see them extravasate into the tissue. When they're there, they then begin to divide as they divide, the dividing cells can further recognize the viral protein and starts making molecules that can destroy the infected cells, but also call other cells into that arena, macrophages, neutrophils, and so on. And that's what an immune reaction is. As the antigen is eliminated by these mechanisms, lymphocytes, other cells, there's no reason for those cells to stay around anymore. They're not stimulated. They enter the circulation. But now you have patrolling the body for the rest of your life, long-lived lymphocytes that can recognize those foreign molecules. And that's why when you get immunized against smallpox, you're, you have that immunization for the rest of, your, rest of your life and hopefully for coronavirus, although we don't know that. We don't know the extent to which those cells survive. Now, at the outset, you said there are two things about cancer that make it different from self. It has these two properties that individually wouldn't be the end of the world, but when you combine them, they're devastating. It's this failure to respond to cell cycle signaling, which results in unregulated growth. And it's this capacity to leave the site of origin and go and grow in an unregulated manner elsewhere. 
And you also mentioned that this is the result of, although you didn't use the word, somatic mutations. And we'll, we, what you, we can clarify for people, these aren't typically mutations that people are born with, although in diseases like Lynch syndrome, that might be the case, that it leads to that. But, but for, these are acquired mutations. So the natural question would be, why is it that a cell that has these acquired mutations that clearly produce a phenotype that is different from self, why wouldn't that be foreign enough for the immune system to act? In other words, why does cancer even exist in the first place? Why doesn't it get squashed out in its infancy? So these mutations, these changes in DNA that are random events as the cell is, as the cell is dividing, can produce proteins that can be recognized or other molecules recognized by the immune system. And they do it in complex ways by breaking down small, small peptides and putting it on the cell surface. But the immune system can recognize these mutations. And it's only been in the last, I'd say, three or four years that we now recognize these mutations uh, as commonly recognized by the immune system. And about 80% of patients with the common epithelial cancers, it turns out as a result of the research done in recent years, do exist that can recognize the products of the mutations. But the immune system against them is too small, is not vigorous enough. What does that mean? Create enough cells, create receptors that have a high enough avidity for recognition to the uh, to the tumor. The immune reaction is not very strong and the growth of the tumor can overcome the small impact that an immune reaction might have in killing some, uh, some tumor cells. Plus, for a tumor cell to survive and grow, it develops certain properties that can suppress the local immune reaction. It can make molecules like transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta. It can make cytokines like interleukin-10. It can cause the development of cells, lymphocytes, that inhibit immune reactions. I mean, virtually every physiologic system in, in the body has stimulatory elements and inhibitory elements. You have hormones that can increase gastric secretion, some that can decrease it. You have a sympathetic nervous system, a parasympathetic nervous system. Well, the immune system is the same. It has effector cells that can be very aggressive in recognizing antigens, and it has regulatory T cells that deliberately suppress immune reactions. And that's one of the things that keeps us from developing autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease. But there are many of these regulatory elements. Recently described myeloid-derived suppressor cells can suppress immune reactions. And so it's the balance of the aggressive immune reaction against the inhibitory molecules that can prevent that immune reaction that is the holy grail of trying to find effective, uh, effective treatments. And effective treatments come in both directions. Interleukin-2 stimulates immune reactions, and we now have checkpoint modulators like ipilimumab or uh, uh, PD-1 inhibitors that uh, can unleash can inhibit these inhibitory factors and thereby stimulate the immune reaction by taking away the breaks on the immune system. So the more we understand, the more we can take advantage of the biology.